Today's scripture comes from the book of Luke, chapter 12, verses 22 through 34. And it reads, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow, sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this little, very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give, to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of God. Will you please join me in prayer? Lord, we come to you in this moment, and we surrender to you. The scripture we just read says that even the wildflowers, even the grass and that grows, is taken care of by you. And we are worth so much more than the grass and the wildflowers, so why do we believe that we, you will not take care of us? Why do we think, have, do we have any reason to not place our trust in you? I, play, I pray that we can toss aside our worries and our troubles in our lives and instead completely rely on you. I pray for Simon, who's about to come up here and preach from this passage. So I pray that you will guide him in these moments. So that the words that he speaks will not be his own words from his own heart and mind, but your words flowing through him. Lord, protect him. Guard his mind and minister to his heart. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. We're continuing our uh, sermon series on the marks of a disciple. These things that we are referring to um, as such are, are outward expressions of our faith. Demonstrations that, that define us as disciples of Jesus Christ. They mark our lives. And as we engage in these marks, as we do these things, these marks help us to grow as disciples of of Jesus. And if you look at the little cards that you've been given this morning and you look at that image on it um, with the path that's leading to the foot of the cross, there's five different paths and I love how they kind of stretch into the distance at the, at the foot of the cross. And I think that helps to represent the, the great and lifelong journey that leads us to Jesus because ultimately disciples in the purest sense they become like the ones they follow. Disciples become like the one that they follow. So as we grow in prayers, presence, gifts, witness, and service, ultimately, we want to become and grow to be more like Jesus. And today, we're looking at gifts and what it means to give as a disciple of Jesus. Now, before I get really into it, I want to make sure that you know that there's a couple of things that this sermon is not going to be. First, it's not going to be a plug for the church budget. In fact, I don't think I mention it again. Okay? So that's one. Two, this is not going to be a, um, you know, a financial deep dive or a view of exactly how much you should give. The Bible certainly has resources for us to, to point us in the direction that we need to go. And if that's something that, that you're wrestling with, I'd encourage you to, to talk about that with your growth groups, to, to consult the scriptures. And if you have questions, certainly ask, you know, Pastor Mike or myself, and we'll be happy to, 
you know, t- we'll be happy to have that conversation with you, but that's not what this is about today. So I want, because my goal really is this, that we would be able to lower our defenses a little bit and hear what Jesus has to say about the why. Why give? What's important about giving as a disciple of Jesus Christ? So the two things that I will talk about today is why growing as a disciple of Jesus has to involve giving. Growing as a disciple of Jesus has to involve giving. And second, how giving changes us to be more like Jesus. And we don't have to look any further than Jesus' own words and his own example to see this play out, to under, help us understand this mark of discipleship. And I'd actually encourage you, as you're preparing, if you're in a, if you're in a growth group or in a class um, or are following along in the materials on your own, like I, I'd encourage you actually to widen the, the scripture passage that you're going to read this week. We've, we're looking at specifically Luke 12, 22 through 34, but if you go all the way back to, you know, chapter 11, 30, verse 37, and then run up through what we read today, Jesus actually speaks to three different audiences about the concept of giving. And he talks to the, in the first part of it, he talks to the Pharisees, the religious teachers, the studies, the people that study the law and lead the, and teach the people in it at the time. He talks to them about giving. He also talks to crowds that were just gathered to listen to him teach. He talks to them about the significance of giving. And then in this passage, which is where our focus is going to be today, he talks to his disciples. He speaks directly to his disciples, his group, his inner group that's, that's following him, seeking to become more like him. And he talks about the heart of the matter, the, the central heart of what it means to give as a disciple of Jesus. And the first thing that Jesus says, first thing out of his mouth is, do not worry. Do not worry. Now, why would he start off with a conversation about giving like that? Do not worry about your life, what you will eat. Do not worry about your body, what you will wear. Jesus begins by pointing at a fundamental human anxiety. Worry about our basic needs, okay? Jesus, but the word that Jesus uses here is significant. When he says do not worry, yeah, he's talking about like the action, but he's talking more, more about not, not just how we think or how we feel, but how we live our life, a lifestyle of Worry or anxiousness about what we have. Jesus is speaking against living anxious about our material goods, living anxious about what we have. And Jesus isn't the only one who, who's ever talked about this. Actually, there's, a, there's an author, Stephen Covey. He wrote a book that was pretty popular a while back, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he has a term for this mentality, this lifestyle of anxiousness and worry about what we have. He calls it the mentality of scarcity. The mentality of scarcity. And essentially, um, this is a good way to sum it up. The mentality of scarcity looks at life like a pie looks at it like a a finite pie. There's only so much to go around, and if someone takes a slice out of that pie, it leaves less for for me. If, if, If I take something, it takes away from your opportunity to have pie, right? That's how the mentality of scarcity works, and it, and it causes this anxiousness, this worry over what we have, because we believe that life is about what you about what you have, and, and it comes from a finite pool of resources. And this scarcity mentality works its way out into our lives in a few different ways. First, it causes us to really hold on to what, what we have. 
it causes us to hold on to what we have because we believe, ooh, if I have something of value, I have to hold on to it. I have to, I have to keep it. I can't let it out of my sight. I can't let it out of my grasp because there's only so much to go around. There's no guarantee I'll ever get it again, okay? That's the first thing that, and it really, you know, it helps us to idolize our stuff. Somebody from the first service said, yeah, um, I've, I, you know, my brother had this uh, bumper sticker once that said, the one who dies with the uh, most wins, right? The one who dies with the most wins, right? We want to hold on to our stuff. We want to keep it. We want to we win over someone else. And the second thing that kind of works its way out into our lives is... Um, about the scarcity mentality is that there's not enough to go around. I mentioned that with the pie. It kind of creates this kind of everyone for themselves. There's not enough to go around. That also leads to this concept that life is essentially about survival. My needs matter most. I have to worry about me. I can't worry about anybody else. Life is about survival. And this scarcity mentality, if we think about it, I think, I think it's fair to say that this generally runs our world. This mentality generally runs our world. Capitalism is founded on this principle, that the world is a finite marketplace. So we have to kind of find our niche within it, our role to try to, to, to earn our spot in this big pie. It's survival of the fittest. We live in a world that's anxious about what we have. We live in a culture of worry. We are trapped, actually, by this scarcity mentality. And Stephen Covey, the guy who coined this term, he identifies the scarcity mentality that actually is is something that holds people back. It holds people back from being highly effective people. But Jesus goes a step further because he says that the scarcity mentality, this lifestyle of anxious worrying about what we have, is something that traps people from being effective disciples, from following him. Because remember the first thing that Jesus says when he's talking about giving is he says, do not worry. Do not worry. Jesus rejects the scarcity mentality. Instead of this idea of holding on to what we have so tightly, can't let it out of our sight, can't let it out of our grasp, Jesus says, life is more than our stuff. Life is more than our stuff. He says, life is more than food. The body more than clothing. In that earlier chunk that I mentioned in Luke, Jesus tells this parable to the crowd of people he, about a rich farmer. And since it's harvest time, I think we can kind of relate to this to some extent. This farmer had brought in this huge crop, one harvest, more than he needed, more than actually he had room for, okay? So what he says to himself is, oh, I'll just tear down my smaller barns. I'll build bigger ones. I'll big, build bigger storehouses. And then once I can get this all in here, then I can rest easy. Then I can be secure and I can eat, drink, and be merry. Not worry. But the lesson of the parable comes when God says, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. What will happen to all of this that you have stored up for yourself and the And the lesson of the parable is to be wary of storing up treasures for ourselves on earth without being rich towards God. And so that, Jesus is speaking directly to this idea. Life is more than our stuff. You can't take it with you. Second, Jesus rejects the scarcity mentality of there's not enough to go around, that life is this finite pie and he says trust in God and his providence in his abundance trust that God will provide for you he gives examples he says look at the ravens they don't sow or reap they don't plant they don't harvest but God feeds them Look at the wildflowers. They don't go to work. They don't, they don't work hard to, you know, put, put clothes on their back. God clothes them. 
And you're far more valuable. We're far more valuable than birds, far more valuable than flowers. The security, their security, is found in God's providence, in God's abundance. Because we, I mean, we can see this too. Rabbits don't have 401ks. No. And birds don't have life insurance, and we're coming up on the end of October. We know that deer certainly don't have accidental death and dismemberment coverage. <laughs> right? We see that. Okay? I'm going to come back to this, this pie. This slice, this idea that life is a pie and there's limited resources to go around, it kind of can... It kind of can trick us into thinking that's our slice of our pie. That's my slice. I mean, I cut it. I earned it. It's mine. But when we trust in God's providence and God's abundance, we realize that's God's pie. That's God's pie. All of it. Every, the slice that we have in front of us, whatever size it is, all of that has been given to us. It was never ours to begin with. Everything that you have is God's anyway. The ravens understand that. The wildflowers understand that. We need to understand that. Trust in God's providence. Trust in his abundance. Trust that he cares for you more than birds and wildflowers. He will provide for what you need. Jesus says in this passage, do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Don't worry about it. The world, the pagan world, runs after all these things. Your father knows that you need them. Your father knows that you need them. He will take care of you. Trust in his abundance and in his providence because as disciples of Jesus Christ, true security is not found in bigger barns not found in our retirement packages, not found in all of these things. They are f true security is found in trusting in God's providence and God's abundance. Jesus rejects the scarcity mentality that says life is about survival. It's everyone for themselves. It's survival of the fittest. Jesus says don't worry. Worrying doesn't solve anything. Worrying about my survival needs doesn't solve anything. He gives this image. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? And it's really interesting, this phrase that Jesus uses, Bible translators go back and forth. They could, you can see it two different ways. It could be translated, who of you by worrying can add an inch to your height, to your stature? Who of you by worrying can add a moment, an hour to your life? So it's almost like Jesus is taking our lives and looking at them along one long string, strand of time. He holds the whole thing in his hand and he's saying, since, since none of you by worrying can add a moment, a little fraction of that expanse on the end of your life, why worry about the rest of it? I, I hold this. I, he's, I know this, he says. I know the end of it. None of us do. God holds our entire lives in our hand. If we can't change the end of it by worrying, why worry about the rest of it? We are entirely in God's hands. Worrying about it doesn't matter. You know, there was a big game yesterday. Iowa Hawkeyes, maybe, you know, number three team in the country. Okay, okay, okay. Well, like, I worried about that game all week, but that doesn't change the outcome. No matter how much I looked at the stats or whatever, nothing that I was going to do from my couch in Marion, Iowa was going to have an impact on the game, right? Okay? And, oof. I thought I was bringing myself some pain by writing that in earlier this week, but whew, we won. We're good. All right. <laughs> the scarcity mentality, this lifestyle of worry, of anxiousness over what we have, it traps us. It consumes us. It poisons us. It prevents us from following Jesus fully. The scarcity mentality poisons us. 
But Jesus rejects it. Jesus rejects this scarcity mentality that poisons us, and he gives his disciples the antidote. He gives his disciples in this passage the antidote to this mentality. It's giving. It's giving. That's the antidote to our scarcity mentality. It's giving because giving transforms us. It has the power to change us, to break our hearts free from this scarcity mentality. When we give, we reject this idea of of scarcity. We don't hold on to what we have when we give because we recognize our life is more than our stuff and we can let it go. We can let it out of our hands because we know our life amounts to more than that. When we give, we break free of this scarcity mentality that says there's not enough to go around because when we give, when we're letting things out, we're trusting God's providence is gonna take care of our needs, that it's gonna flow from his abundance back into our lives and he will continue to provide provide for us when we give we are changed we are broken free from this idea of living as survival for the fittest because and that everyone is for themselves because we place we provide for other people's needs we place their needs above our own trusting God all the while giving is the antidote this can transform us and it can transform the world Jesus says, do not worry. He tells his disciples not to live in a life trapped in the, in, in the scarcity mentality. And that's why growing as a disciple of Jesus has to involve giving. It has to. And I promise that when you do, when you make this commitment to give, to follow God in this way, your giving will change you it will have an incredible impact on your life. And I don't expect you to necessarily take my word for it. And that's why I want, I want you to listen to the testimony of one of your congregation members, a fellow Marian Methodist, about the impact that giving has had on his life. Take a look at this video. So when I was growing up and uh, from my first paycheck, my dad required the 1010 so the first 10 percent went into savings the other 10 percent went into went to church and then I got to keep 80 percent of it it was um, pretty easy to do when it's a smaller paycheck and also easy to do when it wasn't my choice um, so moving on to college as I, I got less involved with the church uh, in my college years um, so tithing did not become a consistent um, form of sacrifice when I got married in my adult life, um, the, my giving changed quite a bit, and not just the amount, um, but the reason I was giving to the church. I, I've been in the financial industry now for over 20 years, and um, the majority of that time I've spent on commission, uh, which meant I didn't know how much money or what my paycheck was gonna be uh, every other week. Um, so that forced me to actually sit down and assess my finances consistently. Um, and uh, when I was deciding my amount to give to the church, to give uh, to, to the Lord, um, I, would, I would make those changes, or I'd, I'd assess the amount um, and really be forced to uh, think about why I was giving it and be cheerfully giving it for the right reasons. And I felt like that really um, changed, changed me um, because I felt that was me actually sacrificing. It wasn't a dad forcing me. It wasn't a um, paycheck deduction that I never saw. It was literally writing a check. Um, every Sunday, we would, Kate and I would uh, take a look at what, what came in figure out our percentage and then give it to him, give it to God. And he has, has continued to bless us um, for many years. So uh, although it's a sacrifice, um, which is what it's supposed to be, we give cheerfully um, and then count our blessings. We have, he's given us a, a wonderful life, wonderful family, friends, our house, my career. Um, and it, 
as you're writing that check uh, or, or giving whatever method you do, it, it's not necessarily the amount, it's really just the reason you're, that you're giving it. So that, that's changed me quite a bit, having to, to force myself to, to think about um, why I'm doing it. Uh, Christian giving just acknowledges that all the um, blessings that we have belong to God and have come from Him. It's a way for us um, to acknowledge it and show our gratitude towards God and to uh, doing His work here on earth. There's a lot of things I really love about Dana's testimony, and I think I want to draw attention to a, a few of them because I, I, I loved hearing about his trust. I mean, living on that, living on a commission structure, there's uncertainty there. I'm sure there were good weeks, right? And then there's some not so good weeks, and having that decision to make that decision to trust God every step of the way, and acknowledging that, I, you know, just at the end of it, he said, oh, oh, you know, my friends, family, life, career, house, everything, everything comes from God, and acknowledging that this changed him, this act of giving changed him, and he pointed, really, to the reason that we give. Because let me tell you something. God is not concerned about your money. God is not concerned about your money. He's concerned about your heart. He is concerned about your heart. And that's why on this gifts icon, we put a heart in the hands here. It's not a dollar sign. It's not coins. It's our hearts. Because Jesus says no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Our hearts are trapped our hearts can be trapped by this scarcity mentality. Our hearts can be trapped by our money. And when our hearts are trapped like that, we won't grow as disciples. We won't be able to place our hearts fully before God to allow Him to shape us and transform us. That's why the heart is in that icon. That's why when we give, we break our hearts free from our money, from what we have, and give it to God. When we give, we acknowledge that all that we have is from God. We want to live, as Dana said, in gratitude. When we give, we recognize the power that money has over our hearts, and we want, to, uh, we want our hearts to be fully in the hands of God. When we give, we place our treasure not on the things of this world, but on the world to come. Because Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Growing as a disciple of Jesus has to involve giving. Growing as a disciple of Jesus has to involve giving. And if you give, you will be changed you will grow as a disciple of Jesus Christ because giving changes us. Giving changes us to be more like Jesus. We become like the one we follow because we know that Jesus gave all of himself because of his love for us. There was never any doubt where his heart was because his heart was always with us. We are his greatest treasure. Jesus, when we look at his earthly life, he had no possessions, he had no wealth, no property. His security was found in trusting in God's providence day by day by day and trusting in God's abundance and doing the will of the one that had sent him. Jesus gave his very life on the cross for our sins and rose from the grave to defeat sin and death forever. And Jesus gave all of that, gave everything so that we could become like him, so that we could experience the riches of the kingdom of heaven with him forever. And if we want to be his disciples, if we want to be his disciples, we must become like him. We must do as he did. That's why growing as a disciple of Jesus has to involve giving and when we do we will become more and more like Jesus 
that brings us to our challenge. So each week, we have what we're calling a growth challenge as a part of this Marks of a Disciple. And I want you to take those cards that, that you had an opportunity to get. And if you didn't, they're at the welcome centers on, on both ends on the way out in little baskets, I think. And um, we want you to take these cards. And um, in the materials, it says, place this in the place that you manage your money the most, whether that's your wallet. It's a good size for that, whether it's in your checkbook whether it's near your laptop or computer if you do, do your stuff online. And the challenge is that this would be a reminder for you to set aside some time this week to look at your bank statements, to look at your finances. What does it say about your heart? And what does it say about your heart for God? And use this opportunity to evaluate your giving. Okay? And I know that's a, that's a big deal. That's a big deal, but that's... That's what, it, that's what we're talking about today. Growing as a disciple of Jesus has to involve giving. And so we need to look at it.